right guys, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking a look at volcanoes. And if you ever look a map of all the volcanoes that we have in the world, you'll see something like this. So right here is a, um, every single red dot or red speck on this map is a volcano. And you'll definitely notice that there's a pattern of where we can find volcanoes. Do you happen to notice where the volcanoes typically seem like they occur? One of the things I want to make sure you understand is there's definitely a reason why volcanoes are where they are, and we're going to soon learn that. But I want to make sure we can start to see that there's a pattern, that these volcanoes tend to be at a certain location. One particular location we're going to talk about is called the Ring of Fire. And the Ring of Fire is really um, the land or these volcanoes that surround the Pacific Ocean. The Ring of Fire volcano is something that hot lava comes out of it. We have this ring of volcanoes that can spew out rich hot magma or lava and so that's why it's called the ring of fire and that's also something that we're going to be definitely paying attention to um, in the next uh, few days. Now one of the things we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking a lot about active volcanoes and dormant volcanoes. Active volcanoes are volcanoes that are actually having um, volcanic activity currently. So Kilauea is an example of an active volcano. We can see lava coming out of Kilauea and new land is forming all the time. A dormant volcano is a volcano that it looks like a mountain. You don't know it's a volcano until something starts to happen. And Pavlov is an example of a volcano that was dormant for a really long time until recently. We're starting to see some activity occur. And what I want to make sure we start to understand is that we've learned a lot about volcanoes from Mount St. Helens. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a little video. I apologize, it is a little long, but I do want to make sure you guys are starting to notice that we can actually predict when a volcano is going to erupt based on clues that we start to find. The eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980 was one of the most dramatic geologic moments in American history. It was a Sunday morning, 8.32 a.m. Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, was the excited call on the radio from David A. Johnston to his colleagues. Within minutes, the colossal eruption had caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage, and 57 lives were lost, including Dave Johnston. For two months prior to that eruption, scientists with the U.S. Geological Survey and the University of Washington's Pacific Northwest Seismographic Network had been closely monitoring the volcano. All the deformation on the mountain was, was local to the mountain, and even more local than that was on the north side of the mountain only. In the nearly two month period before May 18, what was essentially happening at Mount St. Helens was that magma or molten material was moving up from some deep reservoir beneath the mountain up into the volcano itself and it began to grow um, or form what we call a dome or a cryptodome inside the volcano. And that inflating body of magma or molten material actually broke the north side of the volcano and began to cause the north side of the volcano to expand out toward the north. We were measuring the rate of, of, uh, of northward movement of the, of the balls at about six feet a day and uh, we knew that wasn't so good. On the morning of May 18, I was driving up Interstate 5, um, headed up to the north side of Mount St. Helens with some parts and some batteries for our time-lapse cameras. And as I glanced over at Mount St. Helens, um, it was a beautiful blue um, sky day, and the mountain was sitting out there, and suddenly I saw this mushroom cloud go up above the volcano and climb rapidly up into the stratosphere. And I was down in the, in the room where the seismographs were at 8.32 in the morning, and I I heard a sound, and I just looked over my shoulder, probably just a split second after the, um, earthquake, the, the big earthquake had started, and saw that this was something very large, larger than we'd seen before, watched it for a few seconds just to confirm that. And then I ran upstairs to the next floor up to the radio uh, desk of the Forest Service, and uh, called, uh, called Dave. And we couldn't get through, there was, there was, no, there was no answer. So I guess I had the realization right away that um, this was some kind of a tragedy. And uh, on the one hand, it was this huge, exciting, and interesting magmatic eruption. And on the other hand, it was 
I was pretty certain that something terrible had happened to Dave. So it was a it was a, a strange day for me. And uh, we were off the ground probably at uh, 9:05 or something like that. I mean, it was really really rapid. And uh, got up to the uh, to the point where we could really see the the mountain well. I suppose between 9:20 and 9:25, something like that. There was this terrific, um, very vigorous uh, vertical eruption column. Uh, there was the uh, stem of the mushroom or the toadstool that then blossomed out at, at greater height. Uh, and uh, for most of the morning, we saw this tremendous uh, ash cloud uh, roiling out toward the toward the northwest. And I can only assume that that was coming off of the big pyroclastic flows that were going off in that direction that later built the pumice plain. It was a very eventful morning, but uh, it was uh, sobering because I remember thinking up in the airplane that it, Dave just couldn't have survived this, um, especially when we got around to the west side and saw all this ash headed in his direction. On the morning of May 18, what actually happened? The landslide basically uncorked this pressurized body of magma and allowed it to um, explode or expand out towards the north very rapidly. This is what we call the lateral blast. Um, it was a horizontally directed explosion of incredible magnitude. It caused this expanding cloud of ash, rocks, and gases to move out across the countryside to the north at speeds of several hundred miles an hour. The directed blast was really the most destructive event that occurred on the morning of May 18. It completely destroyed an area of 230 square miles in the matter of um, somewhere between five and, and nine minutes. It essentially killed every living thing um, within an area of 230 square miles, and it destroyed hundreds of acres of virgin forest, and it was an incredibly spectacular event. We put out news stations, uh, and we quickly started to uh, re-monitor the volcano again because we had no idea what was going to happen. Before the dust had literally settled in the summer of 1980, um, there were USGS scientists swarming all over the area out in the blast zone, studying the pyroclastic flows, studying the debris avalanche deposit, studying the directed blast deposit. Uh, we thought it likely that there would be more eruptions during the summer, and indeed that, that took place. And suddenly this immense black eruption cloud came pouring up out of the white um, layer that the cloud tops and I couldn't believe my eyes I mean I thought this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life we we learned a lot about how you interact with the civil defense with the public um, with the press and that was transferred by the press to the world and as a result I think volcanology took a quantum leap in science as well as applicability to, to society's needs. The subsequent eruptions were actually, most of them were forecast fairly accurately by the USGS team of scientists. So when it looked like another explosion was about to take place, our helicopter crews would pick us up and we'd move out to the outskirts of the, of the blast zone. We'd watch and photograph the next eruption. And as soon as the eruption stopped, we'd race out there and study the deposits while they were still hot while they were just after they'd settled onto the ground. So it turned out that the six years that Mount St. Helens was erupting in the early 1980s was an unprecedented opportunity for USGS scientists to study hot, fresh, young, and exciting deposits from explosive volcanism. We learned incredibly new and important bits of information about how volcanoes like Mount St. Helens work, what kinds of deposits are produced during these explosive eruptions, and how to anticipate and mitigate the consequences of explosive eruption. So seismic activity is something that we obviously are going to use as clues. And seismic activity is talking about earthquakes. It could be a really large earthquake, it could be smaller earthquakes. And what we found out from Mount St. Helens is that the intensity of the earthquakes Two months prior to it actually, actually erupted, we started seeing these massive earthquakes starting bigger and getting bigger. And we started seeing an, an, a large amount of these earthquakes occurring. And so that was a clue that something's going to happen to Mount St. Helens. And so if we start to pay attention to the earthquakes, then we can start to pay attention to when there might be some physical activity or volcanic activity. So here is a map of the last 30 days of the world where we've had earthquakes. 
What I want to make sure that you're understanding is that you see these patterns. Notice the ring of fire has a lot of earthquakes. There's a lot of volcanoes. So hopefully you're starting to get a sense and starting to maybe even ask questions. What's causing all these volcanoes and earthquakes to occur at the ring of fire? Make sure that you have your notes ready and we will talk about them in class. Have a good day.